What's your all-time favorite song? Amazing Grace. You never heard that? Yeah, that's like they... I, that's I know gospel. You, yeah, that's gospel. You listen to gospel music? Well, once in a while. Once in a while? I know you wanted me to say I'm so lonesome I could cry, didn't you? No, I just threw huh? it out there. No, I didn't know Well, when I said Amazing Grace, you had that look on your well, face. Well, I, I wasn't... I, I was trying to think of the melody of what that sounds like. Amazing... Oh, 1st, 2002. Terry Bradshaw stepped on a football field in Pittsburgh for the first time since the day he retired. It was an unforgettable night in the Steel City. But it also begged a question. What took so long? That's a great question, and there, there's really no simple answer to it, but I think it, it all gets back to Terry Bradshaw. I don't like all of that. I don't like going back. I, don't, I never like going back. To go back to me is a step back. Yeah, but people like yourself are part of the memories I know that. of, I know of, that. of, of millions of fans Trust me, who identify that. with you. I, I know. I know that. I know that. You look, look at this room, and it's filled with all these great pictures. And I know. It's a little embarrassing, but, but I, wanna... I didn't do this, by the way. <laughs> I don't like this stuff. Started coming. Kids, my kids are bringing their dates over here, and the, kid, the guys are going, your dad is so awesome. <laughs> and I'm going, all right, this is cool. team ever. The first quarterback to win four Super Bowls. But though he played his entire career in one of America's great football towns, his departure from Pittsburgh was a messy divorce from a marriage that was rocky from the start. For some reason or other, he never felt totally appreciated and welcomed in Pittsburgh, and he did not become as much a part of the community as all those other players did, those Hall of Famers, Green, Swan, Franco, Ham, Lambert, Blunt. Terry was on an uphill climb all the way from, from when he first came to Pittsburgh. Southern kid from Louisiana Tech. He was an outsider. I'm a small town boy. I like small cities, country life. Uh, living in the city of Pittsburgh didn't exactly one of my goals in life. It was never a match made in heaven, but in 1970, gritty industrial Pittsburgh fell in love at first sight. Bradshaw was the number one pick in the draft, the golden boy, the anointed savior of the NFL's worst team. Pittsburgh was smitten. That's a blonde bomber. Yeah. And Bradshaw whispered sweet nothings in its desperate ears. It's not like the old Steelers, believe me. The, the public, uh, the football world might as well wake up and, and just take what I'm saying and heed it because uh, we're going to be a winner this year. I'm sure of it. What followed was a predictable and familiar story. The young quarterback struggled, and the hometown fan... Would take five years to mature. Having been the number one player drafted, you didn't want to see him take that long. And so they got all over him. They were brutal, the fans. What was your reaction the first time you got booed? I was devastated. I hyperventilated. I was devastated. It was like, oh, I don't mean to play this bad. But Bradshaw's misadventures were epic. As a rookie, he completed fewer than 40% In the final game of the season, he was sent in to replace the Steelers' injured punter. The result was another addition to a growing low-light reel. We used to go in and look at the game films, and the, the defensive reel would be this big, and the offensive reel would be this big. We'd come off the field on defense, and Bradshaw going in and throw an interception on first down or something, and uh, we're right back out on the field. You know, I mean, we were like, give us a break, and I get a drink of water. You know, Terry did some things that, that, that were a little, you know, he'd throw the ball and fall out of his hand, and he made some, he made some, some bonus plays. But that's, that's, that's the way it is, as you learning the game. Bradshaw's growing pains were nothing compared to the physical pain he seemed to experience on a regular basis. The injuries that you would sustain in a game and... Devastating. Uh, but worse, it looked like your career was going to end and you'd expect to see a, an ambulance come up on the field and, and you'd be twitching on the ground and then you say, oh, you know, his career's finished, it's over, he's never gonna play again, and then you'd be back 10 minutes later. All the guys would give me the Oscar of the year, because I'd run around, I'd flop out there like a chicken with his head cut off. 
He would go on to star in such Hollywood classics as Hooper and The Cannonball Run. But a compelling case could be made that Bradshaw did his best acting. He had a sense of drama. He did have that. Unfortunately, his coach had as much use for drama as he did for entertainment. Sure. Yeah. You sure about right, well, that? well, if it's a wrong quote, you can you can correct you, me. This is you, you. This is you talking. I couldn't believe how cruel Chuck was. You would think someone as smart as Chuck would be a better psychologist. And I was the kind of a guy who needed a pat on the back. Shouting at me only made things worse. Lots of times I wish I played for Bum Phillips for someone like that. Right, that's true. Why would you say something like that? Why wouldn't I? <clears throat> I don't want to say things like that. I'm, I don't, I'm not proud of that quote, but it's the truth. My rookie year was horrible. I'm out beside the doorway in Houston and Mr. Rooney's talking to me, telling me how good I'm going to be. Because it's my rookie year, and it was a struggle. You're going to be great. You're going to be great. I am standing right in the doorway. I walk in, stands up and finds me. What kind of s*** is that? And there I am, got to go out and play. Another time telling me, if you don't play well in the first half, going to play Cleveland, I'm, you know, I'm going to pull your ass out of the game. How would you describe your relationship with, him, with, with Terry? Business-like. You know, it was all business. It was something that, uh, uh, you know, I think you see a lot of Terry on TV right now. He's fun-loving, you know, and he, uh, you know, kind of devil may care. How about that, huh? <laughs> we couldn't have that in our quarterback, our, our leader on the field. It had to be businesslike, and it had to be, uh, you know, we got to get this done, you know, and this is how we're going to do it. There came to a point where Terry defied Chuck, and sometimes even on the field, but say, we're not going to run this, we're going to do this. On the bubble, go with the bubble. They haven't seen it. Go hurt them on a 32 goal. Left side, oh, come back 32. Oh, okay. I drove him crazy. I drove him crazy. He wanted me to be a study holic like he was. I couldn't study. For five years, the coach and the quarterback rarely saw eye to eye. Bradshaw remained a maddeningly inconsistent talent and Noel never hesitated to replace him when he struggled. Even in his fourth and fifth seasons, Bradshaw was benched in favor of Joe Gillum and Terry Hanratty, stoking passions in the stands and lending credence to an emerging theory that Bradshaw was just a dumb country bumpkin. The players on the team, I think, loved Hanratty because he was smart. Somebody told me that you want your quarterback to be like Bugs Bunny, and uh, Hanratty's like Bugs Bunny, and, uh, and Bradshaw's a little too much like Elmer Fudd. They want to know about my, my entrance exams. What kind of grades did I make? <laughs> God, it's a football game here, people. It was something that I just despised. Um, and it's hard to defend yourself because you can't. You got to have Chuck Knoll defending you. You got to have Rocky Blyer. Rocky Blyer didn't help it. He's talking about how I changed plays and stuttered in the huddle. It seemed like nobody would defend me. Hell, nobody would come to the rescue. stand-up guy. He never hit. After a bad game, he'd show up at that locker room and answer questions as long as the waves kept coming. Do you remember your first interview with Howard Cosell? Oh! I don't know. Ladies and gentlemen, here comes the NFL's number one flop. Monday Night Football. How about s***? Somebody would say, what was the turning point, Terry? And he'd say, well, when you see uh, uh, Swanee going over there over the middle, how can you not throw the ball to him? So I looked to the left and froze him, and I looked back, and Swan was all along. I, I really, I should have drilled the ball to him. He's wide open. Then the next wave would come, and somebody would say, what was the turning point, Terry? And he'd say, well, you know, when you see old Stallworth open on that sideline, golly gee, where else you going to go? Stallworth was there, but I, I, I caught the ball and just got rid of it because I didn't have time to... Uh, so it, it, Terry gave everybody as much as he could a different story. And he said whatever popped into his head. What do you, write what you think. <laughs> Terry uh, talking to you would tell you what you want to hear. <laughs> you know? uh, and uh, you know, that's, uh, that was part of his shtick. Today, Bradshaw's shtick endears him to millions as a TV personality. 
but it was on the other side of the microphone that he invented his exaggerated persona. I very definitely could see him occasionally act a way that wasn't truly him. You know, he would be putting on a little show and acting much more country than he really is. If you're watching, talk to my agent about my next movie. <laughs> Make it a Western. He's a bright, thoughtful young man, and here he was playing this kind of uh, strange character. And I'd look at it and say, what's he, you know, what's he doing? He was acting, and maybe he was better at it than anyone realized. Hard to beat. I can play a buffoon, I can be an idiot, I can be silly, crazy, which I am. I can use it and be anything with that image that I want to be, knowing deep down inside the joke's on you, it's not on me. I'm a whole lot smarter than you think I am. He had been called a simpleton, but Bradshaw was far more complex than he appeared. He emerged from his early years battered and scarred, unable to reflect on the days when Chuck Noll patted him on the back because of all the other days when he didn't. Unwilling to acknowledge the fans who cheered him on because of all the other fans who didn't. There was a ball game that we played and Terry got hammered pretty good and, and there was a segment of, the, of that stadium that cheered and it wasn't everyone, but it felt like it was the entire stadium. He never forgot it, it was painful for him. It was painful for me and everyone else that, that witnessed that thing. The resentment and the anger I had for the for being called dumb and booed and pushed in and out of the lineup. I was never good enough. I mean, it wore you out. It wore me out. It wore me out. After years of enduring what he felt was undue criticism and unfair treatment, Terry Bradshaw had had enough. All right, by God, you booed my ass, you called me honky, uh, you called me Ozark Ike, Lil Abner, made fun of me, and I'm st my ass is still here. And you hadn't gotten rid of me yet. Chuck hadn't gotten rid of me, nobody. That was the new angry white boy from the South. Pissed is what it was. And I had to learn to control that, and that's what I learned how to do. I learned to use it as a tool. His new toughened psyche was the only thing he had lacked for Bradshaw already possessed all the physical skills you could hope for in a quarterback. Many are too young to have remembered what a tremendous athlete this Terry Bradshaw was. Terry could run like the wind. In one year when he was at 215, he was clocked as the fastest man on a Steelers squad. Catching Bradshaw was hard enough. Bringing him down was another thing altogether. In those days, the referee didn't blow a quick whistle to protect the court. Guys, you lost sight of him. And then the seconds would tick on, and here came Bradshaw out of the pile. Terry was strong as a bull. If he just decided to take off and run, the poor cornerback coming up to meet him got the worst of it, I guarantee you. He could hit like a ton. Of course, his arm was phenomenal. With that arm, Bradshaw set a national javelin record in high school. Slowly, this raw athlete began to grow up. As he honed his talents in the pro game, the one-time loner was emerging as a team leader, and he began to develop the self-confidence that would enable him to quarterback a football dynasty. I got mad at Dwight White in practice one day. He hit me and knocked my helmet off, and, and, and I was steaming. And so I got his face, and I said, you listen to me. You may lose with me, but you're never going to win without me. You got that? I went over and sat on my helmet, you know, trying to get my, he comes over and he goes, how, did, how does that go again? I said, how's what go? That, 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 that saying you just gave, I went, Took us all <laughs> between the two of us trying to figure out what I said. You can lose with me, but you can't win without me. And that was probably very much appropriate if we ever lost Bradshaw because he was just so key and so critical. And when he finally got it together, it was together big time. Bradshaw and the Steelers improved in each of his first five seasons. In 1972, Pittsburgh reached the playoffs for the first time in 25 years. 
through the draft, the Steelers began to surround their quarterback with Hall of Fame talent. And by 1974, all the pieces were in place. In Super Bowl IX, a stifling defense and conservative offense directed by Bradshaw gave the Steelers their first ever world championship. The following year, they repeated in Super Bowl X. On what proved to be the winning touchdown pass in the fourth quarter, Bradshaw was knocked cold. Some wondered, however, whether the drama king was simply performing another act. This time, We knocked oh, out. Oh, God. That's another story. My <laughs> brother wears me out because I'm laying. I'm laying on the turf. Watch the dog. Wait a second. I'm laying on the turf. <laughs> and he, my brother does this. He's such a turd. <laughs> and he says, you, you look up, touch, see him, catch it, and you go, back down. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I said, do you not realize the struggles of a champion trying to get up off the mat? And, I, and oh, he wears me out. So that was another act he's saying, that right? Was, that's what he is saying. But no, it was no act. I don't remember anything. I don't remember leaving the field. Do you know what I remember? I'm on the table, and I hear these voices. Back in my brain, and you're just like, is this real? Am I alive? Terry, and I hear this, Terry, Terry, you did it, 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 you did it. And I look, and Brookshire is standing <laughs> over me like, <laughs> like this, and it's like, ah! <laughs> By 1978, Bradshaw was delivering the knockout blows. Pittsburgh opened up its passing game, and Bradshaw threw for a career-high 28 touchdown passes. In his ninth season, he was named the league's most valuable player, and he had certainly made a splash in the Steel City. On the field, Bradshaw was like a kid in a schoolyard, calling his own plays and having the time of his life. But off it, he couldn't escape a painful stigma from the past. In the week leading up to Super Bowl XIII, his dumb image resurfaced when the Cowboys' Thomas Henderson said, Bradshaw couldn't spell cat if he was spotted the C and the A. During the course of the interviews that week, no, I'm fine, let him do what he says. And, you know, you say the right things just to avoid stirring it up anymore. But inside, it, I was steaming. I mean, it really burnt me. Bradshaw channeled his anger into perhaps his best game ever. He threw four touchdown passes, produced the first 300-yard passing day of his career, and was named the game's most valuable player. Bradshaw is back, and he's going to swan. The squad makes his circus catch. Unbelievable catch for the touchdown. I could play in the big game. I may have my mistakes. I may turn it over, but I would come back somehow, some way. But I would like to think that I was a big game player. He proved it again the next year, leading a fourth quarter comeback to earn his second straight Super Bowl MVP award. Bradshaw had fully won over his fans and critics. He also had a new appreciation for the way Chuck Knoll handled him early in his career. Once I proved that I could handle the heat, once I proved that I could... me he forced me to grow up I think it worked you know he may not have liked it but it worked yeah I would have loved to have been admired like Marino and Montana and Staubach and but look how we turned out look how I turned out he's Hall of Fame four-time Super Bowl champion one of the greatest quarterbacks ever played the game obviously in my mind the greatest quarterback that has or ever will play for the Pittsburgh Steelers and that's how he should be remembered. Winning is all that's ever mattered to Terry. It takes something special to be a winner. The thing I want to do is help make uh, the Steelers a winner. And uh, being uh, the greatest passer in the professional football league, uh, that could be great for the person individually. But still, it's what you can accomplish 
while you're doing these things that really make you the top-notch football player. Now, if I can complete 20 passes out of 100 passes and take them to the Super Bowl, that's a great year. Winning football games is the only thing that's important. It's not me, it's not statistics. And winning championships is the measure of every player in any sport. And we did that and we did it together. To me, that's what I treasure. That's my memory, that's what I take to my grave. You have two daughters, right? Now, sooner or later, you probably will have grandkids. Not in my lifetime. How old are your daughters? 16 and 14. Well, in, in, in six or seven years. They, six my ass. Yeah, what they, do you mean six? How well, old are your kids? Uh, 18. A boy or girl? A boy. Oh, well. But wait a sec. So if, you're, if your daughter's 16, no, wait a sec. No. <laughs> If, you're, if your daughter is 16 and, you know, 23, she could be married and have oh, a yeah, kid. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, but she's but not well, going to be. Uh, well, let's say that happens and you're sitting around and you're 75 years old and your, gra so. and your grandkids say, what was it like to play in the National Football League? And is there one antidote that you would tell your grandkids, say, this is what I like? This I is would just, people ask me the greatest moments and this and that. And they ask me the players and I tell them, look, there's only one thing that matters, and that's Super Bowl 9, 10, 13, 14. Forget the rest of it. Forget all the other junk that doesn't really make a difference. Go to Super Bowl 14 and take that touchdown pass at the end of the game to John Stallworth, that 78-yarder. That's who I am. Now Bradshaw pumping, firing downfield. There goes Stallworth. Goes Super Bowl 13, the pass to Swanee. A perfect strike by Terry Bradshaw. I love it. You can go Super Bowl 10, and the bomb to Swan at the end of the game. I came through with a big play. My worst fears in all of those games is the fear of losing a Super Bowl. I am so thankful I never experienced it. And now here, I'll tell you why. Only Montana and I can talk about this. You know, I can sit down with the great Kurt Warner and I can say, or I can sit down with Marino. I can sit down with Elway and all these greats, greats that ever played. And I could say to them, I never, I never lost a Super Bowl. And that means a lot to me. I don't care about the numbers or being one of the great. I never lost Super Bowl. To play in the National Football League, captivated, mesmerized by the game of football, always there's such a passion for it. So I'm very fortunate because everything I have in this room and outside and everything I am is all because of, of the Pittsburgh Steelers and because of of winning the champion, those Super Bowls, and it's a pretty good life, isn't it? It's a pretty good life. Looking around this room, to me, in a way, this room symbolizes a journey that you've made. And yet, I've read where you said you didn't enjoy that journey. It's just a childhood dream come true, but I didn't like the business side of it. I just thought it was a game, man. I didn't know this was so serious. You know, I just, it's just to me, it was, it was just, just a game. The heightened pressure that came with success sapped the joy out of the game he loved. Enjoying that success was, was so temporary because just, you just got, you know, are you really happy? Did it make you happy? No. Why didn't it make you happy? Because it, because you, you want me to do it again next year. I don't want to do it next year. I want to enjoy this for a whole year. Now I've got to repeat it and, you know, it, it wore me out. Though he was a Pittsburgh icon, Bradshaw paid little attention to the cheers, remembering all too well the boos from the same fans 10 years earlier. When he won the Super Bowl and won the MVPs, and kept being the Bradshaw that we know now. Uh, he won them over, but he didn't know it. When he did win them over, he both. And as long as you understand that, 
you're fine, and I understand it. So we won, now they love me, now I'm brilliant. Fine. Oh. And unfortunately, so did Bradshaw's right arm. Following the 82 season, he opted for surgery. Throw the ball 10 yards. For all but one game in 1983, Bradshaw's injury prevented him from doing what he loved most, playing football. Was Chuck, did he help you on that or did he? No, he didn't help me on it. <clears throat> Chuck's thinking is, if he can't play for me, he's no good to me. I got a team to coach and games to win. My job here too. And as the athlete, you're on the outside going, how come nobody loves me? How come nobody, you know, why? You just feel so isolated. I wouldn't even go to the game. Bradshaw read it in the paper. His response is, well, I mean, how does he know? I mean, he hasn't talked to me in three months. And I'm doing everything I can to try to get ready. I'm doing every surgical procedure. I'm trying the minor bird. Well, and Bradshaw says, ooh, I feel the power. Oh, I feel the powers, Cope. <laughs> in his final appearance as their quarterback, the man who always played his best in the biggest games threw two touchdown passes to help the Steelers secure a playoff berth. It was classic Bradshaw. But his elbow forced him out of the game. His 14-year career was over, and it was ending just like it began. He was the outsider looking in bitter, frustrated, and full of disdain for Pittsburgh and Chuck Knoll. In 1989, Terry Bradshaw was to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And although the ceremony was a time to celebrate a storied career, it also confirmed that many of the wounds Bradshaw had suffered in Pittsburgh had yet to heal. Instead of having a member of the Steeler organization present him, Bradshaw chose friend and broadcaster Vern Lundquist. Mr. Terry Bradshaw. Papers here, media here. How can Terry do this? Why doesn't he have a former player? Why doesn't he have a coach? Why doesn't he have the Roonies do it? Somebody from the outside? And Terry had said to me, he said, you know, if Mr. Rooney was alive, I would have had Mr. Lo Rooney do that. I mean, I love that man so much. Of all the people that you talk about with affection, Art Rooney always comes up. Mm -hmm. When you went into the Hall of Fame, we have that bite. Art, Art Rooney. Rooney. Boy, I love that man. I, I know you're watching, Art. I love you. You are always, always by me. I mean, that doesn't speak well for me. I didn't want to face those people. The Pittsburgh fans, the Pittsburgh press, Chuck Knoll. I mean, I was pissed. The Steelers and about Chuck Knoll because of all the players in my 14-year history here, nobody got the kind of preferential treatment the Bradshaw guy. I mean, Chuck, though, no, don't hit the quarterback. If, you know, don't get. It was like he was, you know, and everybody knew that. The so called feud he had with Noel over the years. Uh, what did Chuck Noel ever do for me? That kind of thing. And then next week he'd be somewhere else and I'd get a clipping saying, hey, I love Chuck Noel. That's Terry. You go figure it out. Bradshaw's love hate relationship with Noel is just one example of how the blonde bomber has always been a man of contradictions. He's had a lifelong struggle with attention deficit disorder, yet he claims his greatest strength as a player was his ability to focus in big games. He only recently revealed that he's battled depression for most of marriages. But in 2002, he decided his divorce from Pittsburgh should be reconciled. I was wrong. I thought that's the point here. I was wrong. The immaturity process, and this is what Chuck was trying to do. Chuck was trying to help me grow up. He knew, he saw that. I didn't see it, but he saw it. I wanted to mend all the fences that I felt like I had created because I wanted to go back to Pittsburgh and I didn't want to go back nervous. I didn't want to have to go back like I'm sneaking into town, which is how I felt I did the last couple of times I was there. That was my intent and the Rooney's, Dan Rooney, uh, made it happen. They made it happen in a grand scale. On October 21st, 2002, Bradshaw returned to be honored at halftime of a Monday night football game. 
I was up in his hotel room that afternoon, and I could see he was very nervous about this. And he said to me, he said, what do you think? I said, hey, Brad, forget it. I said, That reception was just one of the most incredible experiences I've ever had. And then when they brought him back out at halftime, the ovation was even greater and longer. Ladies and gentlemen, the blind bomber, Terry Bradshaw. And then you're going, then you feel silly. Of course they care, you know? Of course they care. Though I have probably been somewhat of an enigma to you, Believe me when I say that. I'm just glad that he has been able to come full circle and, and know that the people here love him, that his teammates love him, and that, that he is someone special in all of our lives. He had made amends with the organization and the fans, but there was still one more relationship to repair. There was no need uh, for an apology uh, at all. I know that Chuck said that no need to apologize, but I, I do believe that uh, in his heart of hearts it hurt him. That, uh, you know, what he thought was a good relationship. In February, on a vacation in Hawaii, and I called him and asked him, would you present me? Like that, he, he said he would. You know, I was asked to do something that I did 30 plus years ago, and that's introduce this young man. You know, now that he's in uh, show business, I'll have to borrow some of that stuff. Here's Terry. <laughs> when I was going through my second divorce, they asked me, you're okay? Asked me how, you know, what can we do? You want to come stay with me, Mary Ann? These are things y'all don't know about Chuck and I. We were playing in a game against the Colts and it was freezing cold and snowing and I went over to the sideline. This is the kind of guy he is. And he saw me, I was shivering. And he took my hands and put them down his, in his pants. <laughs> I appreciated that. I can say that, Coach. You, rem you remember that, don't you? I didn't go way down in them, I just went down in them. Chuck Noel was my teacher, my mentor, but in the greater sense, he became my father because I spent all my time with him. The problems were never really problems. Chuck Noel never let them be problems. They were my problems. They weren't anyone else's. I just wanted to win, and I wanted to do everything I could to please him. I, you know what, even sitting by him tonight, I'm still trying to please him. I guess I'll always be that little, little child in me that I've always been. The coach Noel, if I, could, if I could reach down in my heart and apologize from every depth that there is, coach, I would say I'm sorry for every unkind word or every thought I've ever had. And I mean that. I'm ashamed of it. It was my doing, my undoing, my wrong, my immaturity, my childishness, my selfishness, all of those things. And I think the wonderful thing about saying that is that it feels good. It kind of cleanses me because I miss, I miss my coach. I, I love my coach. I miss Chuck Noll. And I... I just... You know what, uh, we're just one big family, folks, and it was all about winning. And this is a man that made it possible. God bless Chuck Noll, and God bless all of you. Thank you very much, folks. It took a long time, but the boy from Louisiana finally grew up in Pittsburgh. I love where I am in my life. I want to take me right now back to Pittsburgh at 21 years of age. 
I'd be a totally different career. Might win more Super Bowls, and I certainly would play better. I'm a totally different person now, as I should be.